Philippians chapter 2, and I know Brother John read it this morning. Thank you, Brother John. Philippians chapter 2. The title of this morning's message is Epaphroditus, a Totally Devoted Christian. At the time of uh, the writing of this epistle, um, Paul, the author of this letter, is in prison. So keep that in mind as we read and as we go along with our message. Um, Let us stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word this morning. Philippians 2, I'll begin reading in verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your estate. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your estate. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord, that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor, fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him, therefore, the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this time, O Lord, this Lord's day. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing and the privilege, Lord, it is to open your word and to read it, O Lord. And I ask, dear Father, that you would help us, Lord, during the message, O Lord, to examine ourselves. And Father, I pray that um, you would bless, Lord, this service and that Jesus Christ will be honored and glorified. We ask and pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. A missionary society once wrote to David Livingston, a British missionary uh, to Africa, and they asked him this, Have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to know how to send other men to join you. What he was asking was, hey, have you, have you found it easy to be there? Have you found a way to spread the gospel there? Livingstone wrote back and said, If you have men who will come only if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. What was David saying? What David was saying was that he wanted devoted men. Not just men to come if everything is okay, if everything is all right, if everything is all comfort, if everything in the missionary is good, but rather he wanted fully and totally devoted men for the cause of Christ. And surely, fully devoted men are hard to come by. And here in Scripture, we have an example in Epaphroditus, a totally devoted Christian. This man was not an apostle. He was not, as far as we know, a pastor. He might just have been a leader, a layman in the church, but he was not holding a position of authority within the church. Nothing is known of his family, his personal background, his conversion, how long he had been a believer. We don't know all these things. But we we do know that he was a member of the church at Philippi. The name Epaphroditus means belonging or favored by Aphrodite, the Greek goddess. So like Timothy, he could have been, he was a Gentile and brought up in Greek education and culture. The name was common and later came to mean loving or lovely. His level of sacrificial service to the Lord 
especially instructive and encouraging to all believers. Because many times we see uh, the, the Apostle Paul, the examples that he lives, and Timothy and Titus, and we say, oh, but he was a pastor. We don't have an excuse here with Epaphroditus because he, he was not a pastor, and he was a great example for us. He exemplifies the spirit of sacrifice for the sake of Jesus Christ. He was not a preacher, teacher. Therefore, his example seems the more relevant to us. Because they chose Epaphroditus because the believers in Philippi chose this man to bring their gift to Paul. They obviously held him to a high standard. They held him, they trusted him with the money they were going to send to Paul. Although he may not have held a, an official position in the church, they knew that this man, Epaphroditus, would have met the Apostle Paul's standards. He had the soul of a servant going willingly to Rome to help Paul in any way possible that he could be used in going to Rome. Epaphroditus truly exemplified what a totally devoted Christian looks like. Sadly, today, not everyone who claims to be a Christian lives as a totally devoted Christian. On the other hand, there are those, though few, like Epaphroditus, who live totally devoted Christian lives and give the gospel in Jesus Christ a good name wherever they may be. Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, I would not give much for your religion unless it can be seen. Lamps do not talk, but they do shine. A lighthouse sounds no drums, it beats no gong, and yet far over the water, its friendly spark is seen by the mourner. It does not matter if you call yourself a Christian, it does not matter if you have the, the name Christian attached to your name. What matters is if you are living as a Christian, what are your actions saying about you as a believer? So let's look closer to this totally devoted Christian and learn from some lessons from his life. Number one, we see how dear he was to the man of God in verse 25. How dear he was to the man of God. Verse 25, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that minister to my wants. Here the first word yet is a term of contrast. What is Paul contrasting here in this portion of scripture? In the verse before this, verse 24, he says, But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Paul's in prison. He has the hope that one day he would get out and he himself would be able to go to Philippi. But in the meantime, he's going to send Epaphroditus to the believers in Philippi. And I suppose it necessary here. He says, I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. This word here, I supposed, means, and it is a mathematical term, which involves careful thought and not come to a quick or hasty decision. So Paul did just not say, oh, Okay, I'm going to send Epaphroditus and that's it. Paul took time and he thought through the pros and the cons. Should I send Epaphroditus? Should he go? Should I send Epaphroditus? Paul took time and time and time and he finally came to the conclusion that he was going to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi. Paul seems a little reluctant here. He seems hesitant to send Epaphroditus back. But... He started over and he's going to send him back to Philippi. Epaphroditus was loved, adored, and cherished by the Apostle Paul. This is the reason why he found it very difficult to send him back. He was, he was a, a, a real help to the Apostle Paul in the ministry there at Rome. He was not, Epaphroditus was not a man whom Paul could say, Oh, good riddance as he's leaving to Philippi. But rather... He wanted him to stay there with him. And we know that Epaphroditus was dear 
to the Apostle Paul by the way he describes him here. In the first part, he describes him as his, as my brother, as my brother. This first description of Epaphroditus reminds us how we become partners in the gospel. That is, through the sacrifice and the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross and him redeeming us, he brings us into the family of God as adopted children of God. And as the family grows, we also grow as in our relationship, not only as sons and daughters of God, but also as brother and sister in Christ. And anyone who is genuinely saved is a brother and sister in Christ. The term brother may not mean much to you if you grew up in a church where everyone is brother and sister. Brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Or like the children here, Brother Jay, Brother John, they know these, they know, they, they repeat what they hear. Brother John, Sister Allen, but they don't really know what that term means as far as being a Christian. But it's a miracle that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a genuine work that God does in the person, bringing them into the family of God. Calling him brother, Paul is also highlighting his affection for Epaphroditus. He is not just calling him brother like people do today. Hey, bro. Hey, brother. How's it been? But he's actually showing affection to Epaphroditus. He is my brother. And when you go through hard times with Christian brothers or sisters at your side, you form a deep relationship with them. And we know Epaphroditus was sitting there with, with, uh, with Paul in prison. While Paul was in prison, he was there bearing the trial with him. How about you? How about you this morning? Are you a brother and sister in Christ? Not that they call you brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, but have you repented of your sins and have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and have been adopted into the family of God? Number two, he calls him his companion in labor. His companion in labor. We get our English word synergy from this, from um, this word companion labor in the original language, sunargos, and describes the interaction or cooperation between two parties to get more work done. In the New Testament, this word is used of a co-worker or helper in the Christian. In each instance that this word sunargos is used, it conveys the idea of an affectionate partnership. It means you know them. You know them intimately. Not only, oh, I only see you and I only work with you on Sunday at church, and that's it, or on Wednesday at church. This is not the idea of going to work nine to five and you just know your coworkers that way, but rather outside of church. He is in his in labor. This term was used of Priscilla and Aquila, Romans 16.3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers, in Christ Jesus. It was used of Titus in 2 Corinthians 8.23. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my helper, partner, and fellow helper. It was used in Christian work in evangelism. In 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and 9, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. So this word synargos, this word the companion and laborship and, and labor, it means of an intimate thing. It means of an intimate relationship one with another. We are working hard towards advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ. What about you? Are you working alongside other believers? Are you working alongside other believers to What is it that you're doing as a believer, not only on Sundays, but throughout the week? Are you being a companion in labor with other Christians? Number three, he describes them as a fellow soldier. A fellow soldier. Here again, we have the word Sin, not S-I-N, but 
S Y N that is with showing the the intimacy between uh, two people a relationship. In here, it's an intimate word of saints fighting side by side from seen and unseen foes. Phillips here, the commentator, picks up on this picture and he translates it, comrade in arms. The only other New Testament use of this word fellow um, soldier is found in Philemon 2, when he describes Archippus, our fellow soldier. Paul shows not only do they work together, but they fight together. Not only is Epaphroditus his brother, and not only is he my fellow worker in the gospel, in the ministry, but he is also fighting side by side with me. If there's a trial here, he's there with me. If there is an enemy there, he is there with me fighting side by side. Fellow soldiers described as a shoulder to shoulder fighting accounted for the success of the Roman army. Before this, of the triumph of Rome, people had armies, but mostly they would fight as individuals. Yes, they had the same uniform, but they fought, they fought as individuals. And because of this, many people lost their lives and armies lost as well. But the, the Roman armies fought side by side. And as a result, the army of the legions were the terror of the ancient world. They, they fought side by side, shoulder to shoulder, with their shields in front of them, their spears ready to attack. And because of this, many people feared because they worked together as one, side by side as soldiers, and they fought. In such a way, we are to advance in harmony against the spiritual powers that are arrayed against us. As Christians, we have been called to arms. Ephesians 6.12, it tells us that, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground. What would you think, let's just say for a minute or so, that me, John, and Jay were in the army? And there's a war going on, and I'm one of their fellow soldiers, and I'm out in battle fighting. I'm fighting and risking my life to fight for whatever cause. And I look around, and I don't see John and Jay. Where are they at? Where are Brother John and Jay? Where are these men? I need their help. So I go back to camp, go into the tent, and there's John and Jay sitting down, drinking some lemonade, the boots off, their gun put apart, their helmet on the floor. I would say to them, what is wrong with you? Don't you know there's a war going on? Don't you know that people are dying out there? Don't you know that we, we need you? And then John and Jay goes, relax, sit down, join us. <laughs> sip some lemonade, sip some tea. Come on, don't, don't take this too seriously. What would you think? Well, lack of service. This would be absurd. And yet, how many Christians are the same? The captain, the Lord Jesus Christ who's commanded us to fight, and yet we take things casual. We take things so easy because, oh, everything's all right. Everything is okay. And tragically, there are far too many spiritual casualties Warfare. There's tragic of divorce in Christian homes. There's tragic of broken homes in the Christian home. There are pastors out of the ministry because they. The use of the word here, soldier, alludes to the difficulties, the opposition, and dangers encountered in the school of Christ. In the past days, a fa famous slogan would say, you are in the army now. This slogan applies to all of God's children. You are in God's army now. You don't have to look too far to see that there's much opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's much opposition to Jesus Christ here 
here in America and in the world. And we are called to fight, fight side by side for the furtherance of the gospel for Jesus' sake. Sadly, many believers do not understand the fact that when they were taken out and rescued from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness is now actively fighting against us. And as a result, many believers are wounded in spiritual warfare because they are ignorant of the invisible battle that is raging among us. Paul used this soldier metaphor in 2 Timothy verses 3 and 4, and he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Paul here is telling Timothy, endure with hardness. Do this now. Do it effectively. Don't delay. Don't take time off. Endure with hardness and be a good soldier. Be a good soldier. General Thomas Jackson, he fought in the Civil War on the Confederate side. This man was a devout Christian who believed in predestination. He saw himself as an instrument in God's will, of God's will to be used of God. And he knew that God was in control and that he would die when God wanted him to die. And because of this, when they were in battle, he would fight. He would be shooting back at the, at the enemy. And he himself was being shot at. But this did not cause him to move from the place that he was at. He would just stand there and fight back and fight back and fight back, knowing my God is in control. And I am going to die when God wants me to die. On one particular battle, General Bernard B. was looking at him as he was hiding behind something to be blocked from the the bullets. He's seen Jackson standing there just shooting back and fighting back thus leading to his nickname, because he said, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. He came to be known as Stonewall Jackson, because he stood there. He did not flinch when the enemy was attacking him. That should be us. Knowing this, whatever happens, my God is in control. My God has predestined a date in which I will die, and thus work for his cause. Stonewall Jackson said this, quote, Captain, my religious belief teaches me to feel safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern my, myself about that, but to be always ready no matter when it may, it may overtake me. Captain, that is the way all men should live, and then all would be equally brave. That's how all Christians should be, as soldiers fighting against our enemy, not flinching, not cowering down, but to be fighting as fellow soldiers side by side. Let me ask you, what kind of soldier are you? Are you a soldier like Paul and Epaphroditus who is fighting back against the foes? Or are you a soldier who is not a good soldier and is hiding somewhere and not being in the battle? Number four, he's described as a messenger. A messenger. At the time of this, when they're sending Epaphroditus, Paul is there. And they need someone. They need someone to take this gift that they have collected, money, to for Paul. Because Paul at this time, yes, he was in prison, but... In the circumstances that he was in, God allowed for Paul to rent a quarter, as they would call it, and live there, but he had to pay it. And this would mean that people can come to him and visit him and talk to him. It was a blessing, but he needed money to pay for the rent in order for him to carry on his work. So the word came out to the the Philippians, whom are we going to send? Remember, they did not have a car. They did not have a plane like we do today. But this man, Epaphroditus, stood up. 
and he took the challenge. I will take this gift to Paul. I will take this gift to Paul. No GPS, no internet to see where's the traffic at. None of this. He just would take this gift and take it to Paul. This word messenger means a sent one, which conveys a basic idea of one who is sent to do a job and associates authority with this. Epaphroditus was thus a sent out as a messenger from the church at Philippi to bring relief to Paul, who acknowledged his arrival, writing that in Philippians 4.18. But I hope, but I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Epaphroditus as a messenger, most likely had others go with him. Maybe not for accountability. They trusted this man in taking the money. But probably for protection, to protect the money. Because there was people out on the roads looking for people to rob them. This trip covered about 729 miles. 729 miles. And yet you find it difficult to come to church 30 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, 2 miles. It covered 729 miles. Most likely it would have taken them 57 days to get there. And yet, he did this. A faithful messenger taking the responsibility upon himself. The church did not force him. He volunteered on his own to go and take this money to Paul. Maybe along the way, Epaphroditus got sick if he traveled during the winter. Maybe he caught pneumonia. This um, thing that this sickness that had nearly killed him, whatever sickness it was. Or maybe he, had, he ate something that was bad in one of the inns, causing him to get sick. When the whole church of Philippi could not be there with Paul, they sent Epaphroditus. Faithful messenger Epaphroditus. Number five, my, mes my minister. Minister. This word describes a person in service or state who held public office, who was so passionately and so dedicated that his duties were done at his own expense. Meaning, I'm not going to get paid for this. This was not paid to go and take the gift or to minister to Paul. He was not going to get paid money. He went there on his own expense. He went there to minister to Paul. This word is used to describe the work that the, that the priests and the Levites did in the temple. He went to provide for his need, or in the King James Bible it says want, meaning need. He went to provide the need that Paul had. What was Paul's need? Well, we know for a fact that he needed money. He needed money to pay rent there in the rented quarters for the two years that he was there. He needed a companion. He needed a fellow soldier, one that would fight with him side by side. He needed a brother, a brother, a, 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 someone that he can um, relate to, someone who can encourage him in the Christian fight. Believers, when we are going through hard times, it would be foolish for us to go to an unbeliever and seek encouragement and advice. You would want to, you should go to a brother and sister to seek encouragement and advice. This is what Paul needed. And this is what Paul got. Companion in labor, a brother, a soldier, a messenger, a minister. No wonder Paul found it so hard to send back Epaphroditus. No wonder Epaphroditus was so dear to this Number two, we see how distressed he was over the church of God. How distressed he was over the church of God. Verse 26, For he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard 
that he had been sick. For indeed, he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. After speaking of Epaphroditus in the highest regard, now Paul is ex- going to explain why he is sending him back to Philippi. For he longed after you all. The word longing here, or longed, means to desire earnestly, to long for greatly, to in the intense crave, possession, or to have great affection for. <clears throat> so Epaphroditus yearned. He desired to be with his fellow believers in Philippi. Paul declares that Epaphroditus demonstrates the same concern for the Philippians that he himself did. As Paul wrote in Philippians 1.8, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all. Thus, they were one in the work of God. Both Paul and Epaphroditus both longed for these believers in Philippi. And he continues to say, and I was, and was full, that is, Epaphroditus was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Full of heaviness means distressed, deep anguish. This is a word that is used for Jesus as he is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and he is in anguish. So is Epaphroditus here. He is distressed. He is distressed because that they have heard that he had been sick. He was distressed not because of his sickness. He was distressed because of the new Philippians had heard. Hey, Epaphroditus is there with Paul, and he's about to die. He got sick, he's about to die. So this brought distress upon the believers at Philippi. But here, Epaphroditus was less concerned about his own potential fatal illness than he was about the effect of this news on the saints of this selfless love. And Prophet is not worried about him. He is worried about the Philippian believers. I don't know about you, but when I get sick, I want everything for me. I want medicine. I want my wife to cater to me. I want everyone in the house to buy it. I just selfish, selfish, selfish because I am sick. But this is not Epaphroditus. He's thinking of others. He's illustrating the truth found in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2 in Philippians. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but let every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Epaphroditus was illustrating the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. When Jesus Christ left his home in glory, he was not thinking of himself. He was thinking of others, knowing that he would come, leave his home in glory, come to earth, take upon human flesh to die for man. Epaphroditus imitated the Savior Jesus Christ. This fact that they were all being selfless, Paul was being selfless, Epaphroditus was being selfless, the believers at Philippi were being selfless. This fact emphasizes how the gospel had affected the previous self-centered pagans in Philippi before they were selfish. Now that the gospel came and they believed and God saved them, now they were selfless. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with, with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. The believers in Philippi and Epaphroditus is there illustrating this truth. Whether one member suffer, all the They were identifying with Epaphroditus in the sickness or death. Are you truly grieved when a brother in Christ is suffering? Does it bother you when a believer stumbles into sin? Do you experience sorrow of heart when a child of God is passing through the deep waters of affliction and trial? Does it bother you when a brother or sister Does it bother you that a brother or sister are just dragging the name of Jesus Christ through the mud? Does it bother you? Do you get distressed when the church of God is being 
attacked, and abused. Yes, to every Christian we meet who is in some kind of distress, we should be ready to say our heart, just our lips, I hurt for you, I hurt with you, I pray for you. The saints at Philippi were suffering over Epaphroditus' affliction, and he in turn was distressed over their suffering. This is how a healthy body of Christ works. There is mutual empathy. And what is the meaning of empathy but your pain in my heart? St the story is told of Theodore Roosevelt, the President of the United States, who sometimes was also known as Roosevelt the First. Even one of his children said that as he would like to be the, ascent, the center of attention in all things, one of his children said, Father always had to be the center of attention. When he went to a wedding, he wanted to be the bride. When he went to a funeral, he was sorry that he couldn't be the corpse. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are believers like that. If they are not the center of attention, they are not happy. If they are not getting recognition, they get upset. Instead of saying, what has a church has to offer for me. Our attitude and what we should be saying is, how can I be used in this church? When you see others around, the church members who are doing the 10% of the church members doing 90% of the work, how does, that, how does that sit with you? How does that sit with you seeing that these, these church members doing all the work, all the load, and you yourself are just sitting back? Does it distress you? Verse 27, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul was making certain that the Philippians understood the sacrifice that Epaphroditus had made for the cause of Jesus Christ. He specifically, one of the saints at Philippi, he wanted them to know that this was not just a cold or illness. Many times we get a cold and a slight fever and we're going to, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, and it's just a regular cold. Epaphroditus did not have this. He was literally about to die. The word here, nigh unto death, means alongside of a neighbor. That is, that death was Epaphroditus' next door neighbor. He was about to die. He was literally about to die. The apostle already had, consider had considerable grief with connection with his imprisonment. If Epaphroditus had died, it would have brought sorrow upon sorrow with Paul. Not only would he be in prison, but also the death of Epaphroditus. And lastly, we see how devoted he was in the work of God. Verse 28, I send him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold in such reputation. Paul said to the believers at the church of Philippi, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Paul is very strategic here in cl the closing of these verses in this section. There were those in Philippi that would have accused Epaphroditus of failing to complete the mission. Now just think with me. In a place like Philippi, which shame was a great thing there. If you failed to do something for the family or for someone, it brought great shame upon you. When they sent Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was going to be there and fulfill his mission. Whether he was going to be there for as long as Paul was in prison, or whatever it may have been. But now he's sending Epaphroditus. And he wants the Philippian, the Philippian believers to know he did not fail in his mission. Receive him, therefore, with joy and gladness. He did not fail. He wanted, Paul wanted to leave little room for doubt. Epaphroditus was not a quitter. 
Epaphroditus did not quit in his mission. I, Paul, am sending Epaphroditus back. He commands the church to welcome him with great joy and honor. Honor, this word here, hold such reputation, and it means to honor him, to continually value Epaphroditus highly. The New Testament emphasizes the importance of showing honor. Ephesians 6 2 to children, honor thy father and thy mother. 1 Timothy 5 17, that the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 6 1, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Sam Gordon said this, quote, Men willing to do what Epaphroditus did are few and far between. These, men are, these are men who dice with death and do not stop at to ask questions. They flirt openly with all kinds of risk, but they do it from a profound sense of loyalty to their friends and a consummate love for their Lord. These, these men, says Paul, are thin on the ground. We thank God for them. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. Now regarding his supply or lack of service toward me. Paul explains why they are to hold Epaphroditus high when he returns to them. So when Paul is telling the Philippian believers, hey, Epaphroditus deserves to be honored. He deserves to receive a hero's welcome because he completed his mission. The reason is because he almost gave his life for the work of Christ. This word here means gamble, to gamble with your life, to risk your life, to, uh, to be reckless for your life, to, be, to have no concern for yourself. This is and this is what Epaphroditus had. He had no regard for his life. He risked his life. He risked his life for the cause of Christ. He risked his life not for career, not for money, not for material, but for the Lord Jesus Christ. He risked his life. He gave his all for the work of Christ. He put everything on the line for Jesus in order to fulfill the Great Commission. He did it all for the work of Christ. I know Epaphroditus would have thought, I'm going to suffer persecution. I am going to suffer many, many things as a believer in spreading the gospel. But I don't care if they take my life. This is the attitude that Epaphroditus had. He went far and beyond for Christ, almost causing, costing his life. For this man, nothing in this, this life was more important than doing the will of the Lord. Even if doing what God required cost him everything, it almost cost him his life. What about you? Are you devoted to the work of God? What is it costing you? Comfort? Oh, I don't want to go to church this morning because it was cold and it was raining. I, I can't talk to people. I get nervous when I talk to people. And yet you talk to everybody else. What is it costing you, friends? Are friends leaving because you're a Christian? And that's what you're worried about, about losing friends? What is it costing you, popularity? Oh, I want to be liked. I want to be liked by everybody. Let me tell you something. Jesus told us in his word that the world hated him. Therefore, they will hate you also. The Moravians were a, uh, a church started by John Huss in the 14th century. Two young Moravians heard of an island in the West Indies where an atheist British man had about 3,000 slaves there with him. This man hated God and hated Christianity, this owner of slaves. And he was determined not to have any man of God, any word of God on his island. He even said that if a pastor or clergyman were to 
um, be stranded on his island. He would accept them, but put them in a, in a room by themselves. They would not allow them to have contact with his slaves because he had enough of God and religion. These two young Moravian boys, they heard of this. They heard that no one was allowed to go on that island but slaves and the slave owner. So what they did, they sold themselves to the British planter. And they used this money that they got for selling themselves as slaves in this island to buy their ticket because this man would not even pay for their, their traveling expense. So they sold themselves as slaves to this island in order to get the gospel there. They sold themselves, not thinking, how's life going to be there? They're going to be slaves. Meaning, I'm not any longer going to see my family, not going to see my friends. I won't have the comforts of life. We're going to sell ourselves as slaves for the cause of Christ, giving their lives for the Lord. This was not a four-year term. This is not, hey, mom, I'll be gone for two years and then I'll come back. They don't know what's going to happen to them. But they know this. We're going to go there and share the gospel, though. It costs us our life. As they were getting ready to leave, they were on the shore. Family and friends and church members came to say their goodbyes to these two young boys. As they got on the ship, they sailed away. They were there the last time. The last time they were able to see their faces and hear their voices. They were saying goodbye. One of the young boys locked arms with the other boy. And he raised his hand. And he called out and said, May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. What was he saying? Jesus Christ gave his life for us. Why not give our lives for him? May the lamb, that is, for all the people that he died, let him get the full reward. Let him redeem all for us to go and to preach the gospel. What matters is not how I live or how long I live. What matters is, is I'm being faithful to the Lord. May that, may that be our attitude. Let us not regard our life and have the attitude of may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Epaphroditus almost died for the sake of Christ. But Christ did die on the cross to bear the, the punishment for sin that sinners deserved. But he did not remain dead. He arose on the third day to showing and proving that God the Father accepted his sacrifice on behalf of sinners. That if any and all who repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ would be saved. If you're not saved this morning, if you're not a child of God, if you're not a brother or sister in Christ, repent now. Come now to Christ. Come to the Savior and repent of your sins and throw your life at Christ. Depend upon Him for your salvation. Do not depend upon your own self, your own works to go to heaven. But depend upon the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if you are a believer, seek to be like Epaphroditus, a totally devoted Christian. There are very few but by the grace of God, we can be fully devoted to Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the example of a devoted Christian. I ask that you forgive us as a church, O oh Lord, for a lack of devotion to Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who died for us, O oh Lord. Pray, oh Father, that you would forgive us, Lord, for a lack of, a lack of service, Lord, for you. Help us, Lord, to grow in love for Jesus Christ, to grow, Lord, in devotion for our Savior, our Lord. I ask, dear Father, that you would help us, Lord, by your grace, and the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to, O Lord, be, O Lord, fully devoted Christians, that we would, O Lord, follow this example of whom, Lord, you have noted in your word, and Father, I pray, O oh Lord, that if there be any unbeliever here, O oh Lord, 
that you would, Lord, bring him to repent of his sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a couple of pray, and we will close in a moment together.